Representative Edelson, let's talk breakfast. Uh, and members, there is a preliminary fiscal note on this bill, but it is not in a form that it, it just received it and it's not in a form uh, for publication. But Ms. Ahrens, can you speak to it as the team assembles? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, a as this, the fiscal note gets more finalized, we will be happy to share that with the committee members. Um, the preliminary estimates that we have, they, they are good for the program. They, I just want to make one mention that they don't include um, minute costs that would be required to help um, implement the program. And so the, the fiscal note mentions that those would be substantial. And so that will have to be estimated at a future date. But the um, preliminary estimate for the first biennium would be about $6 million, so for both years of 2020 and 2021. And then for the second biennium, the assumption is that participation would increase as the program moves forward. And so it could go up to more like $11 million for 2022 and 2023. Thank you, Ms. Adrians. Representative Edison, Ed Edelson, excuse me, welcome to the committee. Would you like to move House File 1037 to be before the committee for possible inclusion in a later K-12 education omnibus bill? Uh, yes, Chair, and I would also like to move the DE amendment. Thank you very much. Um, members, uh, we have the author's amendment before us, the 1037 DE1. Uh, Representative Edelson, do you want to speak to the amendment at all? Um, no, it just gets it in the shape that I would like it to be in. All right, thank you very much. With that, uh, all those in favor of the DE amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Edelson, to your bill, as amended. Mr. Chair and members, well, first of all, um, I, we are passing around treats from Patisserie Margot, which is a, a little patisserie um, in, uh, in Edina that uh, did a jump, or a, what is that, kickstart, and so really cool business. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for hearing this important bill today. Last week, we heard perspectives from several, several experts and advocates, school from school nutrition personnel to leaders from Second Harvest Heartland, concerned about ending childhood hunger. One of them suggesting that Minnesota can do more to improve the learning day for children if we ensure kids are not starting their day hungry. Adjust, addressing childhood hunger and food insecurity is a bipartisan issue. I am happy to report we have both Republicans and Democrats as co-authors on this piece of legislation. Let's just do a quick exercise. I know we've, we've all been kind of sitting here for a while. Um, how many of you here and in the audience too have gone without breakfast? Raise your hand. Now you have rolls, so that's good news. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm sure many of you would say it was hard for you at some point of the day to focus or pay attention because your body and mind was consumed with the idea of meeting one of your basic human needs. I'm going to get a little personal here because I truly believe in this legislation. I grew up to a single mom in poverty, which is surprising because I represent Edina now. Everybody has these stereotypes. We struggled with food insecurity, always visiting food shelves growing up, and always I had free lunch. On occasion, I would have free breakfast, but even then, some 25 years ago, I knew, like all the kids that got, other, other kids that got free lunch, that having breakfast down in the cafeteria before school held a stigma. Not only that, but you had to rush to eat. This bill helps normalize eating breakfast at school without stigma. House File 1037, as amended, takes a big step forward in providing breakfast to more children who could use another opportunity to get nutrition in their bodies to help their minds at the start of a school day. This bill does a few things. It creates definitions on what breakfast after the bell service in a school can look like. There's three different options a school can decide. It says that schools with more than 33% of kids eligible for free lunch qualify for breakfast after the bell. It says that schools must draw down federal breakfast dollars before the state kicks in additional breakfast reimbursement. That a participating school must provide breakfast free of charge to all students. This bill also asks the Department of Education to report back to us in two years about the progress of breakfast after the bell implementation and identify other barriers schools face in implementing free lunch for all the community eligible provision. With me today are experts on tackling hunger who want to add their support to this bill. I'd like to call my first testifier, Colleen Morarity. Ms. Morarity, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Colleen Morarity, and I'm the Executive Director of Hunger Solutions Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for the opportunity to address you again today on this important issue. 
As we mentioned last week in our hearing on school nutrition, Minnesota has missed an opportunity to adequately support school breakfast in the past. Our national partner, FRAC, the Food Research and Action Center, just released this week their breakfast scorecard for the country, and Minnesota is in the bottom 10. The bottom 10 of states in this country that are supporting school breakfast or that have levels of participation. Low participation in the school breakfast program is costly on many levels. Students miss out on educational and health benefits associated with proper nutrition, and states and school districts miss out on up to $12 million in federal funding that is available to support school breakfast. We can and should provide incentives to schools to serve high quality school breakfast and make sure that all students in Minnesota are ready in their school day to learn. The support for the Breakfast After the Bell program is the most efficient and uh, appropriate way to deliver that meal to the numbers of children that we wish to serve. And eligible schools that, can, that participate in community eligibility will not only be able to afford breakfast, but lunch for everyone in the school. I cannot stress enough how important it is that, that schools who are eligible for community eligibility are enrolled in the program. The fact that there is a resistance to participate in the program has meant that we haven't had the kinds of funds available that are needed to support nutrition programs. And pr the state funding that is provided can offer breakfast at no charge to many low-income students. Minnesota would join other states and would take a lead in this effort to make sure that every school has students ready to learn in the beginning of the school day. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Moriarty. Uh, Representative Edelson, do you have other testifiers? Um, yes, I'd like to call Kelly Wolf. She's the Director of Public Affairs and Advocacy at Children's Hospital. Ms. Wolf, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kelly Wolf. I am the Director of Public Affairs and Advocacy at Children's Minnesota, and I am here today in support of House File 1037, the Breakfast After the Bell Initiative, and I would like to thank Representative Edelson for her leadership on this very important bill as well. Children's Minnesota is the state's largest pediatric provider of health care. We serve an incredibly diverse patient population with about 44% of our children reliant on Medicaid. That number is actually between 70 to 80% for Minneapolis and St. Paul Jen Pete's clinics. Because of the diversity of patients we see, we know the unique and varied challenges our children face today. Many lack the basic supports that we know they need to th thrive, such as safe and stable housing, access to reliable transportation, and adequate healthy and nutritious food. Over the last few years, our pediatricians and providers have seen an increase in the number of children and families who experience food insecurity. And as part of our mission to be every family's essential partner in raising healthier children, we started a social determinant of health pilot program called Community Connect. Working with multicultural, multilingual navigators, we work with families to connect them with our in-house food supports, as well as community-based resources, such as food pantries and food shelves. Last year, 42% of the families that participated in the program identified a need for supportive food resources. We made almost 3,000 referrals out to community-based food resources in the community in 2018. And these are just the families we know that were willing to identify their food needs. So we know there are likely many, many more that experience food and hunger. As a healthcare system devoted solely to children's health issues, we know that access to nutritious, healthy food is fundamental to a child's development. Research shows that children who experience food insecurity are more likely to struggle in school, have increased absenteeism, and exhibit behavior and developmental problems. They're more likely to visit the school nurse, experience stomach aches and headaches, and are at more risk for mental health issues. They're also more than three times more likely to be overweight and obese, also presenting additional health complications. One study showed that hungry children are 31% more likely to be hospitalized at an average cost of about $12,000 per pediatric hospitalization. Offering free breakfast to all students in a way that they can easily access will help decrease stigma and shame and may eliminate disparities between food secure and food insecure children. 
Low income children who eat breakfast at school have better overall diet than those who skip breakfast or even eat breakfast elsewhere. Additionally, we know that consuming um, school breakfast greatly improves their health and nutritious intake. We know that school breakfast participants are more likely to consume adequate vitamins and minerals, have lower body mass index, and eliminate symptoms of hunger. Providing breakfast to children when they can most easily access it is one small step that we can take in providing all children the best and healthiest start to life. Children should be children. They should spend their time focusing on playing with their friends, learning and growing into successful and happy adults. They should not be worried about where their next meal comes from or the shame associated with accessing those resources. So on behalf of Children's Minnesota, thank you for your time today and for this very important issue that you're considering, um, considering and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as well. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. Representative Adelson, do you have any other testifiers? Uh, I do. Um, Chuck Oshaki from the principal of St. Paul Public Schools. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, my name is Rebecca Bino. I'm from Second Harvest Heartland. Obviously, I'm not. Uh, Chuck Ochaki. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Ochaki had an incident at the school this morning that needed to be dealt with. So I am here today to talk a little bit about the partnership that Second Harvest has um, with St. Paul Secondary High School, which is the, the school that Mr. Ochaki is the principal of. So Principal Ochaki School and Second Harvest Heartland started partnering about a year and a half ago to help figure out how we could get more students eating breakfast at their high school. At the time we started working together, South St. Paul Secondary was serving breakfast in the cafeteria before the start of the school day, a little bit like uh, Representative Edelson talked about. Um, Despite the high need among students in that school, only about 12% of the students who are eligible for free and reduced breakfast were actually eating it on a regular basis. Uh, Principal Ochaki saw a lot of the issues that um, others have talked about that hungry children deal with and wanted to do something about it. So they decided and worked with us to implement a second chance breakfast. So now when you go into South St. Paul Secondary, students are actually getting breakfast between first and second period. There are five different kiosks located without the, throughout the school where students can go and pick up a bagged breakfast, a grab and go breakfast as they call it, and then take it to their classroom and eat it in the first five minutes while kind of classroom announcements are happening. So um, this is one of the F breakfast after the bell uh, methods that's talked about addressed in HR 1037. So previously, when they were doing breakfast in the cafeteria before the start of the school day, only about 250 students ate on a regular basis. Now with second chance breakfast, over 1,000 students are eating breakfast every day. Um, their goal is to have 100, all 1,700 of their students eating. Um, Mr. Ochaki told me that the difference th that this has made for their students and their school has been immense. In his words, I am not sure what we did. I'm not sure why we did not implement this program sooner. It has been a life changer for our students. So obviously breakfast after the bell has a lot of impact and we look for your support. Um, thank you for letting me testify today. And I want to end with an invitation um, from Principal Ochaki himself for the, any of the members of the committee who would like to come and see Second Chance Breakfast happening in real time, he's welcome um, to have any of you come to the school and see what it's all about. Thank you very much. Re Representative Edelson, any other testifiers? Just one last testifier. Noah Atlas, please, from Minnesota School Nutrition Association. And he's my last testifier. All right. Mr. <laughs> Atlas, briefly. Surely. Um, yes. Uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Noah Atlas. I'm the Director of Child Nutrition for Noka Hennepin Schools, as well as the Public Policy Chair for the Minnesota School Nutrition Association. Um, representatives, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I um, am speaking to you today as a representative from the Minnesota School Nutrition Association. Last week, this committee gave multiple groups the opportunity to speak about the benefits uh, that feeding students can have on students' ability to learn. Um, you also heard that while lunch participation in the state is good, there's ample opportunity to increase breakfast consumption, which means that students aren't taking advantage of it for many reasons. 
We know that students who eat breakfast are more productive, less disruptive in class, visit the, the nurse less often, and perform better on test days. I know this is a little cliche, but when it comes to learning, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. The legislature's attention to this issue and financial support will send a strong message to school leaders and the public that Minnesota thinks fueling young minds for the benefit of their education is important and will drive educational improvement in many schools. We greatly appreciate the support that you currently provide to school nutrition programs and hope that you will consider this, um, this major step forward in ending childhood hunger by making breakfast more widely available to our guests. I hope that, you, that I can answer any questions that you may have about breakfast after the bell. Thank you, Mr. Atlas. Representative Joachim. I just want to say that I would encourage members to, to drop in on one of the schools that provides us. I happened to work at a school la this fall that did, and it was a great opportunity for kids to, they brought the food right into the classroom, they settled down, they did morning work for the first 10 minutes, which meant math, a math sheet, and fine, uh, fine motor skills on the back, which was tracing in first grade. So not only were they getting breakfast, they were getting time to hone skills too before the teacher started the day. So it was killing a lot of birds. Oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was doing a lot of things at one time which were very beneficial to the students. All right, thank you, Representative Viewakim. Representative Krishak. Thank you, and uh, are we done? Uh, mine is just for the bill I, in general. So. I, believe, I believe we are. Yeah. That, yes, okay. Representative Krishak. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, members, and to the author. Uh, good bill. Love the concept. I, I have, because we're in a finance committee, I have some uh, technical things, and I'm wondering if I can direct these to Mr. Strom or the House Research. Well, certainly. Um, so, Mr. Strom, uh, you, re you pulled a report for me a couple weeks ago with fund balances for schools. And I was looking at uh, two of my schools, Little Falls is 42. They have a a current fund balance in their in their lunch account of 550,000 and then peers has 330,000. I noticed with this program respectively Little Falls would get 82,000 and peers would get 60 or 6,200. I'm wondering would uh, would these funds be eligible that they could pull out of their existing balance? Mr. Strom. Mr. Chair, I think actually the Anoka Food Service uh, uh, Director might have the best uh, nope. answer for you. There's, there are lots of federal rules that apply to the sure. fund balances okay. in, in Fund 2. Mr. Atlas, can you help us with this? Yeah. Um, basically, the federal rules say that you cannot use federal funds to um, sub, um, supplement another a paid meal, basically. So when you get funds, those are to be used for the program itself. So. In this case, you couldn't supplement a paid student's meal by using your, your balance. The other thing that I would say is those funds are there to replace refrigerators and coolers and freezers and equipment and things like that. So the fact that they have a fund balance keeps that program going without having to use general funds, but you're not to use those funds for that for that reason. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I understand. Uh, uh, and I respect everything you said. How I do want to just add, you know, we have to get creative around here sometimes. And I wonder if there isn't a way, uh, because this will come against the target, and, and we have lots. Of, we're going to hear lots of programs. But I'm just wondering if there isn't a way for the bill author to to look at all the mechanisms. I respect the schools have healthy fund balances. I also know with the way uh, the finances are set up, you can't move things across, and so sometimes schools end up with balances that that become unused. So. I'm not going after your funds. No. I'm trying to be creative, but I just I wanted to ask that question. No, it's a, it's a fair question, but again, um, you're not you, you can't um, you can't subsidize paid meals okay. or other meals by using fund balance. And okay. It's just it's just how it is. Representative Krisha, one more question um, to the testifier from St. Paul. I think the the one that was talking about the uh, grab and grow grab and go program. Oh, and you can come to my schools anytime and see any of those programs. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is Krisha. And I'm sorry, can you help me with the name again? Rebecca. Okay, I can do Rebecca. Um, so here's my question. Uh, I'm I'm working through this. I have five kids, been in the education. So and and uh, Chair Joaquin mentioned that these kids are grabbing food and eating and multitasking. It's probably you know, there's, there's benefits to that, but I do have to ask this, are there negative sides to that? I mean, I, I, I see we've got kids with cell phones, we're doing so many things at once. Are we now encouraging this multitasking behavior and rushing them um, and through that? And the other side of this is, uh, you know, if you're grab, and I don't know how this works, and I'm, I'm trying not to throw cold water on this, trying to understand, but are they grabbing things and just grabbing maybe a bite of something and throwing the rest away as their high waste? I know what it looks like in my house. Mm -hmm. And I have five kids that trope through and all the other kids. And so that's, I'm just asking about those mechanisms. Sure. Rebecca. 
Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative. So the the rules that would govern um, the food that's served to the kids would be the same whether they're eating it in the cafeteria before the start of the school day or um, in the classroom. So, so in terms of waste, there would be no difference between the programs. Um, as to your question about multitasking, um, I haven't seen or read anything um, that would indicate that that is a problem. Representative Grisha. Okay, thank you. Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and also for Rebecca. Um, I taught in the area of physical education and uh, I don't think I would want my students to be uh, bringing their breakfast into the boys' locker room or out in the athletic fields. How is that handled in your school? You know, that's actually a great question, and I, I don't have a good answer to it, but I can... can... Uh, M Mr. Atlas apparently does. <laughs> um, one of the things we had to do to overcome that was we, in all of our secondary schools, middle and high, we had that same question. Uh, band teachers don't want food blown into instruments, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we designed a meal that was uh, grab and go, truly grab and go in a bag. And it's up to that teacher to say, you're going to put this aside for this period. And when you go to your next period, you can eat it. But we made it so that they'd be able to do so. And, Representative Dutton. And Mr. Chair, could you give us an example of what's in a bag of grab and go? Right. Mr. Atlas? Uh, in a meal might consist of a, a cheese stick, uh, a whole piece of fruit or cut fruit, and a muffin. Uh, it might be mini pancakes, um, again, always fruit, uh, but it might be raisins, uh, might be sunflower seeds, um, milk or juice. Uh, they have that option at breakfast. So uh, things that aren't really spillable, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, as a gym teacher, you would say, hey, grab a grab and go or grab something that'll last through first period. And Representative Detmer, last yeah, question. Mr. Last question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> no, I have a, <clears throat> both my brother and I were uh, 18 months apart. We both taught for 30 plus years. And uh, I have uh, also a father and two brothers that uh, uh, also was a custodian at, in schools. Uh, any feedback from the custodians in terms of cleanup and so forth? Mr. Atlas? Uh, yes, there, there are. Um, I can tell you that I had a principal at one of my schools who was very reticent. His custodian was very much against it. Um, and when he retired and the new custodian had to take over, he was a little reticent. But when the program started, you make do. You make changes. You put garbage cans in hallways. Uh, you provide a bag that the garbage can go into. Nothing's ever perfect. Um, I've had custodians tell me not to serve grapes because they'll be thrown down the hall. Um, things happen and you have to make do the best you can, but I think because a custodian may be uncomfortable is not a good reason to not serve a meal to a guest or a student. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the uh, audience who would <laughs> testify either for or against House File 1037? Seeing none, Representative Edelson, uh, any closing comment? Um, just to rep uh, chair to Representative Demers' point, we actually have implemented breakfast after the bell at my son's school, um, and it's actually worked really well. Um, we had the same concerns in terms of the custodian uh, situation that you discussed, but it's it's worked well, and kids um, kids are eating, which I think is a, a goal for all of us. So thank you, Chair, and um, I hope that spill will be ro rolled over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm.